I think um, we can start. Um, just before uh, to start with the presentation, I would like you know that uh, the presentation is going to be recorded. Okay, so let me see if I can. Uh -uh. Okay. Uh, I think we are now recording. Yep. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you uh, very much for attending uh, this online seminar, uh, a listening test uh, organized by the Art Soundscapes uh, project as part of our seminar series. Um, my name is Lydia Alvarez, and I'm going to start with a brief presentation uh, about the Art Sonsky project, in case um, some of you don't know about it yet. Um, this project uh, is an um, ERC project with, uh, which deals with sound, rock art, and sacred landscape. Uh, trying to determine how these three components interact uh, together. With this in mind, our principal investigator, Margarita uh, Diaz Andreu, uh, brought together a group of researchers from uh, different disciplines and backgrounds, including archaeology, uh, psychology, physics, uh, ethnography, and uh, acoustic engineering as well. Uh, working all together around rock art, uh, soundscapes, and uh, acoustics, exploring um, humans' perception and interpretation of sound uh, in the past. Um, to achieve this purpose, the Art Soundscapes project has a combination of six um, research lines, focusing on the dis different uh, disciplines I mentioned before. Um, the project started in 2018, and the fieldwork completed so far includes different rock art areas all around the world. Um, uh, for example, we have uh, performed some measurements in the Mediterranean area in Europe, in Siberia, in Asia, um, also in South Africa. Um, uh, if you are curious about our work, um, I invited you to visit our website and our Facebook page, where you can follow all the activities and uh, all the um, publications we have uh, regarding the results of the project. Okay, so um, this is one of the dissemination activities we are doing for the project, the uh, seminar series. And our um, seminar today is entitled From Here to There. This uh, from here to there, <laughs> designing listening tests that accurately uh, measure the perception of room acoustics. Um, let me introduce you our brilliant speaker today, uh, Daniel de la Prida Caballero. Um, after completing an engineer's degree on audiovisual systems at the University of Carlos III de Madrid, in 2013, and a master's degree on acoustic engineering and vibrations at the University of Valladolid in 2014. He completed a PhD in acoustics from the Technical University of Madrid two years ago. Um, his PhD focused on the assessment of um, the subjective per perception of environmental noise, airborne sound, insulation, and room acoustics. Um, at the moment, he is an assistant uh, PhD professor for sound and image engineering at the University of Carlos III de Madrid. And uh, not being busy enough with the research and the lecturing, he is also the local uh, representative for a Spanish, for Spain, sorry, of the John Acoustician uh, Network of the European Acoustic Association. Uh, in the today's seminar, uh, Daniel is going to comment on uh, some factors that can significantly affect the correct designs, performance, and analysis of listening tests for room acoustics. 
Um, he's also uh, going to give us uh, insight on the analysis methods uh, for robust and a highly comparable result in uh, listening test as well. And I hope he uh, gave us some, some advice on the best, best practices and standardizing procedures to improve the reliability and consistency of listening tests. Okay, so now with further delay, I give the floor to Daniel. Thank you, Lydia, for the for the Sorry. presentation. I don't think I deserve this much of a presentation, <laughs> but yeah, Let, let's start with what I'm going to, to, to talk about today. So uh, yeah, as Lydia has already introduced, I'm going to talk about the designing of listening tests uh, for the accurate measure of the perception, in, specifically in the field of room acoustics, but also it, actually, it will work for any other um, similar area in architectural acoustics, as I will I will show you at the end of the presentation. So just let me one second. Okay, right now. So first of all, I had a brief introduction about myself, which I am not going to do because already Lydia did it better than I will do. So uh, basically, right now, I'm, uh, as Lydia told you, I'm assistant PhD professor in the Carlos III University of Madrid. And during my PhD, I mainly work in psychoacoustics for soundscapes, uh, sound insulation, and, and room acoustics. So let's get to the point already. Uh, just a brief table of contents so you all get to the pace of what we are going to be talking today. First, we are going to see a brief overview on what are listening tests, uh, which possible sources of bias we are going to, uh, to have when we do listening tests. Then we are going to talk about the main, uh, yeah, the main focus of, of today's talk, which is on listening test protocols. Uh, I don't, I'm not totally sure if you know what the protocol is in a listening test, but don't worry, I'm going to explain it. And I'm going to show you the most, uh, yeah, the most used uh, protocols uh, in room acoustics and also the issues that each of these protocols have. Then I'm going to present you, um, yeah, some of our contributions uh, to, to get homogeneous and powerful protocols in room acoustics, because as I will show you, uh, we have quite of a problem with that at the point. Then I will be talking about some analysis methods, uh, some of them has already been used in acoustics for a long time. And we are going to highlight some pros and cons, uh, but we are also going to talk about some other uh, types of uh, analysis that I have not seen uh, used very often in acoustics, and in particular in room acoustics, that I found out in some other fields of sensory perception, uh, that I think that it could be applicable and for some cases are better than those that we have uh, already used in acoustics for, for a long time. Uh, then I'm going to show you some examples uh, of the use of uh, some of the protocols that I normally use in architectural acoustics and also the uh, some of the analysis that I also use to analyze the results of listening tests. I'm going to very briefly present to you the DIRA toolbox, the difference testing architectural acoustics toolbox, which is a toolbox that we that we have developed and we have already released a beta of, of the toolbox, but we are aiming to finish it uh, yeah, very, very briefly and, and, and to release it in the final form. And uh, then I will finish with some closing remarks and some recommendations as, uh, as Lydia said. So first of all, a brief overview. Uh, in the field of acoustics, if we think of acoustics, uh, there are two different worlds that get involved. Uh, first world is the physical world. So it is the propagation of sound waves through the air. We know how to measure them. We somehow understand them properly. We have uh, equations that allow us to describe them. But uh, the, the propagation of sound itself is nothing without uh, thinking of the understanding of the sound by our brain and our auditory system. And that's what the perceptual part of the of acoustics uh, get involved. 
Um, so how our brain understands the sounds when we are uh, w- when they have reached our brain, and in the middle between the physical world and the psych- uh, psychological world, we have the physiological world, which is something that we uh, also understand quite properly. So when the waves impact our our eardrum um, and they propagate through our auditory system, they convert to uh, yeah to electrical impulses. And we can understand that properly, but from that on, so from the auditory stem on, uh, we don't really understand how our our brain works and how our emotions uh, work uh, to the sounds that we hear. There is people working currently on, on describing models of the brain so we could properly understand how we are going to perceive things without the need of assessing it, but we are not dead yet or at least uh, I, I've not been yet during my PhD. So <clears throat> the other way uh, we can assess how we perceive the sounds uh, right now is by experimental procedures that we can conduct with participants, which uh, most of the time are called listening tests. So regarding listening tests, what are listening tests? Why should we use them? So listening tests, our laboratory experiments that we conduct with participants, as this participant that you can see there in the, in the slide, uh, which mainly are used to assess how we perceive sound, either by comparison of different sounds or by hearing one sound and assessing different uh, characteristics or attributes of this sound. They are normally conducted under control conditions. As you can see in this slide, the participant is actually in an echo chamber. And it is in an echo chamber, so we have control conditions, specifically uh, control conditions of background noise. The participant is going to hear several sounds during the listening test. And uh, this particular participant had to assess uh, differences between a stimuli, uh, which were really subtle. So it, it is actually recommendable to do listening tests in control environments with low background noise. So. In this picture, as you can see, we use an anechoic chamber for that. Some other things that you can see in the picture, uh, which represent the control conditions, is that probably you are not seeing any, yeah, any instrumentation in the in the room other than the screen. We do that also to control the conditions, to control the possible sources of background noise that the computer fans or any other instrumentation uh, could do. Uh, also, as you can see, um, the anechoic chamber itself, we had two different anechoic chambers and we decided to use this because of the color of the walls, the gray color of the, of the walls. So it is more visually neutral to the participants. Okay, So many different things that we can see in this picture that are uh, explaining that for conducting listening tests, we normally need um, control conditions. And as you can see, the listening tests are normally conducted through headphones or loudspeakers. I normally do them through headphones because it is easier to control the conditions. Uh, but they could also be done through, loud, uh, through loudspeakers, and uh, it is actually mandatory in some specific cases. So this is what listening tests are. And why should we use them? Because as I told you, we can understand properly the physical world we can properly understand the physiological world, but up to now, we are not able to properly understand without experimentation how our our brain understands sound. So for that reason, we are using the human being as instrument of perceptual measurement. The same way we use a sound level meter when we want to know uh, how much acoustical energy we have in in a specific place, If we want to assess the perception of a certain sound or a certain collection of sounds, the best thing that we can do is to use the instrumentation that it is going to hear the sound in the end, which is actually the human being in most of the cases. So yeah, listening tests are using the human being as instrument of process formation. So in a listening test, there are several entities that interrelate and that are really important for the for the assessment that we are aiming to obtain with the listening test of course the main the main one is going to be the the participant 
the main is going to be the participant because actually what we are going to measure is the perception of the of a collection of participants. The second entity that it is uh, very relevant is the experimenter because the experimenter they they are going to design the listening test uh, for yeah to to check some hypothesis that they might have, and for that reason they are going to or for that purpose they are going to select a collection of stimuli. They are going to decide which kind of protocol is going to be used to conduct the listening test. So how the participants are going to interact with the stimuli and how they are going to answer. That's what the protocol is. Uh, but I, I will explain that in detail in a few slides. Also, the experimenter will have an influence on the hardware that it is used to conduct the listening test. So the loudspeaker, computer, uh, loud uh, headphones, or any other instrumentation uh, that we are going to use for the playback and the gathering of the data from the listening test. And finally, uh, the analysis tools, which also the experimenter is going to, to select. So the experimenter and the participant are the two most important entities in a listening test, but also these other, these other entities, uh, so the stimuli, the protocol, the hardware, and the analysis tools are very important. So we accomplish what we want to accomplish uh properly and um yeah they are all connected to the experimenter so if i will have to say what all these uh entities have in common in a listening test is that all of them are subject to bias and the bias of each of these uh specific entities which are interrelated in a listening test can have a significant influence on the results of the assessments. So actually, uh, depending on how well we are controlling the bias, the outcomes of a listening test can be totally different. So therefore, we have to be very careful on how we select uh, stimuli. We have to be very careful as experimenters on how we select the protocol that we are going to use uh, to conduct the listening test. Also, we have to be very careful to reduce the bias that the uh, instrumentation that we use for the playback uh, can have in the listening test. And of course, the bias, um, yeah, uh, to, to, to look for the analysis tools with the less bias and which are more powerful for the analysis of our listening test results. So in today's presentation, we are going to focus mainly on the protocol, uh, which is also in close relation with analysis tools that could be applicable to, to the data gathered from the listening test. But these other entities are also somehow relevant. So I'm going to summarize the main sources of bias that we should be careful of controlling when we are conducting listening tests. So regarding this, the experimenter, there are several sources of bias that we have to be aware of and try to minimize. Um, some of them I have listed here, which are the observer expe expe expectancy. Uh, uh, this means that um, we should be careful as experimenters not to bias, mm, nor the interface that we use to conduct a listening test, nor the participants through the interaction between them uh, with them and also not to bias the listening test through a not precise selection and design of both the stimuli and the protocols that we are going to use during the listening test. It is quite easy actually to auto bias once, uh, uh, ourselves when we are conducting listening tests because we sometimes have an idea of what we want to get but uh, we should be careful not to bias the design, the performance, and the analysis of the listening test so we get what we wanted to get. Also, there are several sources of bias that can influence the participants themselves when they are doing the listening test. One of them, one of the most important, is the fatigue, uh, the fatigue bias, uh, which can make the participants to vary in their hearing abilities during the listening test due to the fatigue. Uh, reduce this source of bias uh, 
we as experimenters uh, should design the listening test to be as yeah as uh, short as possible. Of course, uh, addressing all the cases that we want to address, but we should try to adjust them so uh, they are as uh, short as possible. And also to conduct the listening test in a randomized order. So the, each participant starts the listening test in a different point, and therefore uh, we don't have a propagation of the bias through the listening test. And also there is another source of bias that affects a lot to the participants, which is the expectation bias, which is when the participants try to try to infer the what the what uh, the purpose of the experimenter, and they try to uh, to do the listening test not in the way they perceive the things, but in the way they think the experimenter want them to perceive them. So we have to be really careful in the selection of the yeah of the statements that we present to the to the participants during the listening test. We have to be very careful with the instructions that we give to the participants as experimenters. And for that reason, one of the uh, better recommendations that I could give is that we should write in advance a document with all the instructions, with all the yeah all the data that the participants should have prior to the experiments so they can properly understand what their task is, but not to interact with them uh, a lot uh, before they do the, the listening test. So they don't have this expectation bias of trying to, to, yeah, to feel our desires when they are doing the listening test. Also regarding the, the stimuli, uh, we as experimenters should be uh, careful not to bias the listening test by a selection of non-significant acoustical exon areas. So imagine we want to assess, uh, we want to compare, for example, in a listening test, um, the perception of a certain venue in their, uh, an historical venue in their original state and in an actual state. So with all the architectural changes that ha that had happened over the years, and imagine, for example, it is a cathedral. Um, we should select a sound sample uh, to to be used in the listening test, which makes sense for that uh, specific venue. So maybe it doesn't make sense to use, um, I don't know, some contemporary music if we want to compare how that specific venue was perceived several uh, uh, yeah, decades or centuries ago. And we should be careful to select a proper, uh, an appropriate sound sample to conduct the listening test. Okay, So we should be aware of not selecting uh, yeah, sound samples or stimuli for the listening test that are not significant for the purpose of what we are doing. Also regarding the hardware and facilities, I have already mentioned this, but we should be really careful that the hardware that we are using for the playback is not modifying significantly the spectral and temporal uh, representation of the signals that we are feeding to the participants during the listening test. And also we have to be really careful that the background noise is low enough in the, in the room the participants are using to conduct the listening test. And also, uh, even though it is neglected many times, we have to. Uh, we should be really careful so that the visual cues that the participants are seeing during the listening test are um, as aseptic as possible, so they don't influence also their auditory perception. Regarding the protocol, um, during my PhD, actually, I saw that uh, the protocol is one of the of the most important entities should, we should be careful with during the design and performance of a listening test. And it can actually introduce significant sources of bias, which can make the results of our um, listening test totally different of what we could expect um, or of what the real perception of the participants is. So we should be really careful when we select the, the protocol that we are using to assess the participants so we don't get a bias in our results due to the protocol. 
I'm not going to mention a little. Uh, I'm not going to mention more information about this right now because uh, this is what I'm going to focus. I'm going to focus uh, in further slides. And finally, regarding the analysis tools, um, there are several analysis tools that has been used uh, during, through the years uh, that are easy to use, but actually can bias the results of that we get, that we have um, gathered during the listening test. And therefore, we should be really careful on the selection of the analysis tools that we use for the for the analysis of the data gathered during the test. Uh, actually, the analysis tools are really dependent on the protocol. So the selection of one and the other um, is going to have an effect on the other. So we have to be really careful with that. So when we have, uh, once we have already mentioned the main sources of bias, that can affect each of the entities that we have in a listening test. This is just a mention of the most important that I found out, but there are many other sources of bias that we should be careful with. Uh, let's get to the protocol. So what's the protocol? And why is it important to talk about the protocol? The protocol is how we present the stimuli to the participants uh, to, during the listening test and how we gather the responses from them. So in this picture that you can see here to the right, which is a representation of a, a visual interface that I normally use to present the listening test to the participants. As you can see, there is a question here. Is the sound X the same as sound A or sound B? The protocol will be how I'm presenting the stimuli to the participants and how I expect them to answer. So in this specific protocol, which is called ABX, I'm first presenting a stimuli A to the participant, a stimulus A to the participants, then a stimulus B, and then a stimulus X. And I am asking the participants to identify which of them, A or B, is the same as X. Okay. Uh, to clarify on this, imagine the example that we were mentioning before. We are, for example, comparing the, yeah, the, how an historical building sounded several years, uh, several centuries ago, and how it sounds in the current states. And imagine that we want to assess whether the participants could detect a significant difference between the original conditions and the actual conditions. So in this case, we'll have two stimuli, which are the same, which could be, for example, the current state, okay? So A, and X could be the current state, and B could be the, the state several centuries ago. And what I am asking the participants here uh, is to detect which of them, A or B, is the same as X, so which is the same as the original states. And they should have to mark here the answer, okay? So as you can see, um, the protocol has a significant influence on how we present the stimuli to the participants, and also in the specific task they have to accomplish. In this specific protocol, they have to find the one that uses the same as X. The protocol that we are using in this, in this specific example, we are using ABX, has a significant influence on the analysis methods that we will uh, later be able to apply to the results of the listening test. So we have to be really careful with it. Um, regarding protocols, and specifically in the field of room acoustics, there are two families of protocols that are mainly used when we want to yeah, assess the perception of room acoustics. One of the families are scaling procedures, and normally in a scaling uh, listening test, we present um, individual stimulus at a time, so we present one stimuli to the participants. So for example, imagine uh, the sound of an organ played in, a, uh, in, the, in the cathedral in the current state, okay? And we present that stimuli to the participants, that stimulus to the participants, and then we ask the participant to rate in a scale uh, different attributes of the sound they have just heard, okay? So this is, one family, one family of, of protocols that it is normally used in room acoustics. There are different kinds of scales. I'm just showing one of them, which is the Likert scale. And then we have some other family of, uh, 
of protocols, which is difference testing. I have I have already uh, showed you um, one of the protocols of the different testing family, the ABX. And here we have some other, which is uh, we present two stimuli to the participants and we are asking which of the two stimuli has more of a certain attribute. Okay, so two different two different ways of approaching listening testing room acoustics. Uh, they are um, all, both of them are really used in in room acoustics, but there is a certain tendency to the use of scaling procedures because we normally want to assess different attributes of the sound that we are presenting the participants. So for example, how do you perceive uh, the reverberation uh, in these uh, stimulus that I am presenting to you? How, do, how clear does this sound, uh, is this sound to you? How um, is the intelligibility in this sound that I am presenting to you? So that's why many times uh, scaling procedures are preferred in, in room acoustics. So regarding scaling, if we talk a little bit in detail, as I already told you, they are widely used in, in acoustics and particularly in room acoustics. Uh, they are used to assess only one stimulus at a time. As I told you, we present one stimulus with, a certain, uh, with certain characteristics. So that can be a sound sample convoluted by the input response of a certain uh, venue, for example. And we ask several uh, to the participants to rate several scales regarding different attributes of the, of the sound they are hearing. They are actually, um, scaling procedures are really easy to analyze because most of the time, what the people are doing is to, to use the mean of the scores which you can see I, I crossed here. And I crossed it here because as you can see in the scalings, uh, the scales have discrete points. But if we do the mean of scores, what we are going to get is something continuous, which actually makes not much of a sense if we are asking the participants to rate the scales in a discrete way, okay? So they are easy to analyze but maybe the type of analysis that have uh, historically been used to, to analyze the data from scaling procedures is not the best one. So they are apparently accurate in terms of response because we have one scale and then we average the response of all the participants and therefore we have a continuous value of the assessment of this stimulus for a certain attribute, but actually are really complex for the participants. And they are really complex and can, um, and therefore they can generate some bias in the participants. One of the bias is the little use of extreme scale items. So many times, if you have used scales or if you use scales in the future, you will realize that most of the people end up using the central part of the scales and neglecting the use of the stream position of the scales. And that's because it is not easy to know in advance uh, what the string cases are going to be. So the people is very conservative and end up using the middle part of the scales. Uh, there are ways to, to minimize the effect of this bias of the little use of the string scale items. But even in those cases, people is normally neglecting to use the uh, extreme, extreme points in the scales. Also, it can have some bias due to the non-linearity of the spacing in the scales. As you can see here, the points in the scales are equally distributed. So we have an equal spacing between the points. However, that might not be the case in the case of perception. For a participant, these gaps might not be or might not have uh, the same distance. So that can also bias the results of, of our listening test. Uh, there is also the halo effect, um, and this effect is related with how we are normally conducting a scaling, um, a scaling listening test. As I told you, we normally present the participants with one stimulus, and then we ask uh, questions regarding several attributes, one after the other. The halo effect 
says that the result that the participant has marked for one of the attributes is going to have an effect on further uh, attribute ratings. So that's also a source of bias in the scaling procedures that should be we should be uh, careful with. And also the difficult for the participants due to the length of the scales. It is not yet clear which uh, length of scales is better. Normally, um, many people is using uh, five points scales because um, the state of the art in other fields of sensory perception have already uh, pointed out that using more than five points is really misleading for the participants and doesn't increase the the precision of of the ratings. But in any case, uh, up to the day, many studies use several points in the scales, nine points in the scales, or even one hundred points in the scales, which actually is really difficult for the participants to be able to discern between that, those many points. Also, mm, scales could be odd or even in the number of points that we leave the participants to select. And also that also can have an influence on the ratings that the participants are, are giving because uh, they normally prefer to have a middle point. So, mm, you know, they, they can, uh, give like a middle rating for some of the of the attributes of the stimuli. So as you can see, uh, for many different reasons, the this type of protocols, the scaling protocols, can be difficult to the participants, but are really efficient for the experimenters. And that's and that's why they have been used a lot. Or that's one one of the my hypotheses of how of why they have been used a lot in the past. But besides all of these um, yeah, possible sources of bias and, and things that make the use of scales really complex to the participants, there is one additional thing that, make the, that makes the use of scales uh, really difficult. And it is the attribute understanding. As I told you, we are normally presenting participants with one, uh, yeah, some sample with one stimuli. And then we are asking them to scale uh, the, the sound they had just heard subject to different attributes. Some of these attributes could be clarity, could be intelligibility, could be uh, reverberation, could be strength, could be many, many different things. And some of the participants could not be familiar them, with them. And therefore, we could have a different understanding of an attribute for different participants, which will actually ruin the whole experiment. Um, for that reason, the use of scaling procedures, specifically if we are asking uh, regarding different attributes, should be conducted with trained participants, or we should train them uh, to properly understand what the attributes um, what this word is meaning. So what, what's the, uh, the meaning of clarity? What's the meaning of intelligibility? Well, it's the, what's the meaning of reverberation and so on? Uh, we have to be really thankful to Linda et al uh, because they developed several years ago the, the Saki, which is an inventory of terms that gives an aseptic explanation of what the reverberation is, the clarity is, the strength is, and, and so they help a lot when we are using attributes in, in listening tests. So this is what the scaling pro protocols are. And this is these are some of the pros and cons. And let's get now with different testing. And in different testing is also used in acoustics, but it is not as used as scaling procedures in acoustics, but it is really used in other fields of sensory perception. So for example, in food theory, so when yeah when the food companies develop new cookies for example they conduct a lot of sensory experiments to assess whether uh the general population could perceive a difference in the ingredients they have used for uh an enhancement of a cookie for example or for the reduction of cost of a cookie and for most of these tasks, they are using different testing protocols. So they are testing, for example, the cookie they had before with a new cookie with the new ingredients, and they are trying to assess whether the participants 
will differentiate them or have a preference on one of them or not. So in other fields of sensory perception, different testing is uh, really used and is used less than this case in the case of acoustics. It, um, different testing employs a comparative approach. And this means that this kind of tests are easily for the participants that the scaling procedures, because they don't have to rate a certain attribute in a scale, but they just have to hear two sounds and select one of them. It's easier for them. Normally, the, the results of different testing uh, are given by discrete results, um, either by the um, preference count, so the proportion of discriminators, which are two measures of how many times or for how many participants uh, stimulus A was selected and for uh, how many participants stimulus B was selected divided by the total number of participants. And that's what the proportion of, of discriminators is. Or, uh, but they are different testing protocols are also suitable for some other analysis tools, which are much more powerful than the proportion of coverage responses and the proportion of discriminators, which is the analysis by the use of Thurstonian models, which I will mention in, the, uh, in detail uh, in further slides. So as I already told you, uh, these kinds of tests are much easier for the participants than the scaling procedures because they involve simple comparisons between a stimuli that we are presenting at the same time for the same trial. And we are not requiring the participants to grade the responses in a scale. So it is easier for them to just select one or the other. So this is what different testing is. Here we have some other example, which of the two presented the stimuli is more reverberant, is more clear, is more intelligible, um, has more intelligibility or question, similar questions. Inside the family of uh, different testing, we have two different types of listening tests, which uh, in the few case, in the few cases they are using acoustics, they are used, uh, yeah, they, they are normally interchanged by the experimenters, but mm, honestly, I'm not completely sure they should uh, be used without a reason. So, there are two different subfamilies of protocols inside different testing. We have overall different testing protocols, which are normally used for complex variations. So they are quite perfect for room acoustics because imagine we are assessing um, yeah, the perception of a certain room, okay? And imagine we now modify by adding um, sound absorption or and through any other measure, we modify the reverberation time of the room, okay? We are not only modifying the reverberation time of the room, we are probably also modifying the clarity, we are um, probably modifying some spatial, um, um, some spatial features of the room at the same time. So through the variation of one um, characteristic of the sound, we are modifying some others. So it is really difficult for the participants to, to know whether the perceptual differences they are uh, hearing come from one of the um, parameters or the other, okay? So overall difference testing protocols are really used for room acoustics because we are not asking the participants regarding a specific attribute. It is just a purely de detection task. They only have to identify the stimuli, uh, the stimulus that it is different. Okay, so the good thing about that is that they are um, recommendable for room acoustics and can be conducted with naive participants because they don't have to know what clarity means, what reverberation means, or what intelligibility means. They only have to try to identify the odd sample and to mark it, okay? Uh, but also at the same time, since we are not asking the participants regarding specific attributes, the results that we are getting are less specific than if we will ask uh, regarding certain attributes, okay? But these other two pros are, for my particular, in my, in my opinion, they counter uh, 
yeah, they are more important than this. And yeah, for that reason, I strongly suggest the use of, of overall difference testing protocols. If we are assessing differences between um, a stimuli that involve room acoustics variations. So there are several types of protocols uh, of overall difference testing protocols. Some of them are the triangle, triangular protocol, the ABX protocol that I have already mentioned, the duo trio protocol, the same different protocol, and many others. Regarding attribute related protocols, this is somehow a mix between the scaling procedures that I showed you and the overall different protocols. And in this case, we are presenting several stimuli to the participants during the test. And we are asking regarding, we are asking questions regarding a specific attributes. Okay, so for example, in this case, we are asking regarding annoyance. So this is something that we uh, normally ask in the case of listening test in sound insulation, for example. Uh, which of these sounds is more annoying to you? Okay, and in this case, uh, we normally use attribute-related uh, difference testing protocols for a stimuli which only change in one specific future. As I told you, in the case of overall different testing protocols, uh, for example, in room acoustics, when I modify the reverberation time, uh, I have great chances of modifying also the clarity or some other acoustical futures. But in attribute we should use attribute-related uh, different testing protocols or a stimuli with fixed and isolated variations. So for example, you can think of, of the use that I, uh, that I told you in sound insulation. We are selecting one sound sample that can be, for example, the passing by of a car. And we can attenuate the passing of the car through the sound reduction index of two different uh, sound insulation elements. So for example, two windows, two different windows. In that case, the difference between the, the stimuli that we are comparing is only due to the spectral change of the sounds. Only uh, it is only subject to that. And therefore, it can be helpful uh, for us to use attribute related difference testing because we are just modifying one uh, future of the sounds. They are mo more complex because we are asking regarding attributes. And therefore, we should use expert participants or at least trained participants which know the meaning of the specific attributes. I have already mentioned this when I was talking about the Saki and when I was talking about the scalings. But they are more specific than the overall because we are um, able to assess the differences. We are able to know uh, the, the proportion of the perceptual change that comes from a specific attribute. Some of the most well-known uh, protocols that are on the subfamily of attribute-related protocols are the uh, M alternative for choice and the M alternative choice protocols. Uh, and I will show you an example of that by the end of the presentation. So as you have seen, we have uh, in different testing, two different types subfamilies of protocols, the overall and the attribute related. And we should select one or the other, depending on many facts, depending on how are the variations between the stimuli that we want to compare during the listening test, depending on the, yeah, on the training of our participants, depending on the, yeah, on the uh, specific purpose of the test. And um, yeah, we, we should think about it when we conduct listening tests. We should not uh, select one or the other arbitrarily. So regarding the listening test, regarding the listening test protocols, we have a really big problem. And it is that as I showed you, we have a high heterogeneity in protocols and analysis methods employed in acoustics. And one might think, OK, we will have different kinds of uh, listening test protocols because listening tests are used in many different fields of acoustics. So we are using listening tests, for example, for some quality, so to see or to, to derive the perceptual changes uh, in the properties of some product that makes sound, so for example, a car. Okay. We are also using listening tests in soundscapes. 
also in, sign, in signal processing, uh, in sound insulation, as I have already mentioned, in electroacoustics, if we want to assess whether we have differences between, for example, two model of loudspeakers. In room acoustics, if we want to assess whether participants can perceive differences, subtle differences uh, between two room acoustic conditions with more reverberation, more clarity, or whatever. And also in medical acoustics. Okay, since listening tests are used in many different areas of, of acoustics, we might think that this high heterogeneity comes from the fact that we are addressing different uh, purposes in different uh, fields of acoustics. But this pro big problem that I mentioned even applies to each of these specific areas. So if I focus, for example, in room acoustics, we could expect that the listening tests that are normally used in room acoustics are somehow homogeneous across studies and across researchers, but that is actually not the case. In this table, I'm presenting um, some of the most uh, cited articles regarding the determination of the J and D, so the just noticeable differences of room acoustical parameters. Okay, so the purpose of all of these studies was to measure the just noticeable difference of the uh, room acoustical parameters that I am marking here. Okay. And therefore, if they are all addressing the same issue, if they are also aiming to get the J and D of these uh, different indicators, we could expect that they will use similar protocols or the same protocol to assess this difference. But that is actually not the case. If we focus in the, on the testing protocol and in the analysis methods, we can see that even in the same area of acoustics, and actually not only in the same area, but for the same purpose, we are seeing many different protocols being used for the same purpose. That might not be the problem, might not be a problem if the yeah, if all the bias, if all the protocols have the same bias and if all the protocols are equally powerful. But uh, from what we know from other areas of sensory perception, that is not normally the case. And also the different protocols that has been used have an implication on the analysis methods, which are also different in many of the, res of the researchers that I'm presenting here, and therefore hinders and make it, makes it difficult to compare the results of different studies, even when the tests have the same aim. This is something that has been mentioned by uh, really important experimenter in room acoustics, which is Lily Wang. Uh, she was doing a, a review of the state of the art of uh, the determination of J and Ds in room acoustics, and she realized that actually, even for the same, even for the same uh, room acoustical parameters, so for example, for CAP, different researchers were giving significant different results of the J and D. So, she said that this could come from many things, but one of the things it could uh, come from is the differing testing protocol that different researchers were using and the different operational power of each of these protocols. So the discrimination that each of these protocols allow the participants to perceive in the stimuli that they are comparing. So as you can see, uh, that we really have a, a big problem uh, in acoustics and in particular in room acoustics because we have a high heterogeneity of protocols being used at the same time. As I already mentioned, this high heterogeneity of protocols could lead to very different results even when we are evaluating the same situation. So for example, when we are addressing, uh, on wh when we are trying to get the, the J and D of a certain of a certain room acoustical parameter. Since we are using different analysis methods depending on the, on the different protocols, it also hinders the comparison of the results between studies. So we are not able to compare result, results of one study with the other because the analysis tools will be totally different. And this can lead to major problems because for example, if, if you remember um, the ISO 33A2 has a list of the just noticeable differences 
for most of the of the room acoustical parameters. But uh, so, so the results of listening tests are normally used for regulatory purposes. But depending on the protocol employed to conduct the J and D assessment, the results are significantly different. So we should be really careful on the selection of the listening test protocol that we are using to conduct listening tests. Um, as I told you, it will not be a problem to use different test, uh, different protocols if all of them will be equally powerful. Uh, so if the participants could uh, elicit the same differences through all the protocols. But in other fields of sensory perception, they have already seen that this is not the case. And depending on the protocol that we use to assess a subtle difference between stimuli, uh, the discrimination of the participants is different. So the protocol can have a major impact on the results. Consequently, the listening test uh, protocol should be studied to determine those, uh, those that are more appropriate and try to homogenize the use of those protocols when we are conduct conducting listening tests. In that sense, uh, we tried to do, a, during my PhD, we tried uh, to do a contribution towards the homogenization uh, of protocols being used in, in room acoustics not only for the protocol them, uh, itself, but also for the analysis tools. And the question that we were asking ourselves, it was that, uh, is there an overall different testing protocol with higher operational power and lower experimental effects, so lower bias than the others? We, uh, by the review of the state of the art, as I mentioned, we saw that in other fields of sensory perception, that was the case. So we wanted to see whether in, Acoustics, so if for auditory perception, that was also the case. And for that purpose, we conducted a listening test. The idea of the listening test was to assess the existence of an overall difference mm, testing protocol with greater operational power and lower experimental effects, as I mentioned. We conducted a listening test for that, in which we compare the same stimuli. So through all the protocols, we uh, compare the we asked the participants to compare the same stimuli, but we used seven different protocols. Some of these protocols had normally been used in acoustics. So the triangle protocol is a protocol that has been used a lot in acoustics. I'm going to explain each of them in detail in the next slide, so don't worry. Uh, the constant reference to three of first, which is a protocol that has not been used in acoustics. Also the constant reference to three of first and middle, which has not used in acoustics, the ABX, which, which it is actually really, really used in acoustics, and particularly in room acoustics. Also the same different procedure, the constant reference in different procedure, and the A not A uh, with reference procedure. So we conducted a listening test using the same stimuli, and we asked the participants to uh, detect the differences between the stimuli through seven different protocols, so to see whether the results were the same or different through these protocols. If the results could be the same, then there is not a problem if we are a TV genius in the use of listening testing room acoustics, but we will have a somehow a problem if the results of the listening test using different protocols give significant different results. So let's see what happened. So to do the listening test, we use three stimuli, which we call S1, S2, and S3, which were obtained through oralization. These three stimuli, each of them, uh, were the convolution of three impulse responses of the same simulated venue or with different degrees of geometrical accuracy. And uh, the convolution of these impulse responses with the same musical, uh, musical sample. So an anechoic uh, musical excerpt of the autumn leaves played at piano. So one of the impulse responses um, was taken from this uh, virtual model conducted with Audion, which we call S1, and also acted as a reference in those uh, protocols that need a reference for, for their conductance. 
Then we extracted the same impulse response, so meaning the impulse response of this other venue, which is the same, but with other degree of uh, geometrical accuracy with a really low uh, degree of geometrical accuracy for the same points of emission and reception, okay? So the only difference between these two were was the, the geometrical accuracy, even though that will have influence in many of the uh, room, room acoustical parameters. And stimuli S3, which was the convolution of the piano with the impulse response of mm, the same position of emitter and receiver, but for the model with the highest um, degree of geome uh, geometrical accuracy. So we had three different stimuli. All the three stimuli were actually the same sound sample. So the autumn leaves played at piano, but convoluted by the impulse response of these three different virtual models. Uh, we could expect these differences to be really subtle because even though the geometrical differences uh, will have uh, an, an impact on the room acoustical parameters, um, probably those differences are subtle for the year, okay? And what we did during the listening test was comparing uh, stimuli one versus stimuli two and comparing stimuli one versus stimuli three. Okay, the same differences, S1 versus uh, is S2 and S1 versus S3 were addressed by the participants through the seven different protocols, okay? Um, I'm going to present now the different um, yeah, protocols that we use. I am sorry, um, the screenshots are in Spanish. I didn't have them in English at this time, but I will explain what we were asking each, in each of them. This is the triangular protocol, and we were asking the participants to identify which of the three sounds was different, okay? So uh, two of them were, were the same, and one of them was different, and the uh, task for the participants was to identify the odd one, okay? This is the triangular protocol. Uh, in this second protocol, which is the constant reference duo trio first, we are presenting a reference, which is not changing during the whole experiment. So that reference is all the time the same. That's the only information we are giving the participants, that the first stimulus in each trial is not changing, is always the same. So they can make an idea of this uh, specific sound, okay? And then we are presenting A and B, which are changing all the time, and the... Um, task for the participants is to identify, again, uh, which of them is the same as, uh, as the reference, uh, either A or B. This uh, kind of test has not been used many, uh, has not been uh, used uh, regularly in acoustics, but it is the recommended uh, listening, uh, the recommended uh, protocol employed in, for example, fluid theory, as I mentioned before. Uh, then we have the constant reference duo trio first and middle, which is intended as uh, maintaining the auditory memory of the participants. So it is presenting the reference twice in each trial. So in this way, you know, for this protocol, the participants in each trial will hear the reference, which we they know that it is a reference. Then they will hear A, then they will hear again the reference, and they, they will hear B, and they have to mark uh, which of them, A or B, was the same as the references, okay? So it is pretty similar to the constant reference duo trio first, but it is aiming at keeping the auditory memory of the participants by presenting their reference two times. Then we have ABX, which has been used a lot in acoustics, and it is actually uh, being used uh, even today a lot in acoustics. And in this kind of listening test, we are asking the participants in this trial, uh, which of the two sounds, A or and B, is the same as X, okay? So as you can see, all of these are identification tasks. The participants have to either find the odd sample or find the one that is the same as the reference or find the one that is similar to A, uh, which is the same as X. 
uh, even though x in this case is not a reference, like in the constant reference, okay, in this chain, in this uh, in this protocol, x is changing in every trial. Then we were comparing uh, same different, okay? So we are presenting the participants A and B, and we are asking them whether the uh, stimuli are the same or different. Then um, we are also using constant reference, same difference. So this is like exactly the same as before, but one of the two sounds um, is a reference, but the participants don't know it. So mm, the idea behind this specific protocol is that uh, reference could be helpful for the participants, but uh, at, in some cases could uh, lead to some participant bias. So we wanted to, to know whether uh, having a reference, even if they don't know it is a reference, had an impact on the uh, discrimination. And finally, the A, not A uh, with reference, which is exactly the same as constant reference, uh, same different, but with the participants knowing that the first stimulus is a reference, okay? So as you can see, we were comparing seven different protocols. All of them are identification or detection task. So the participants are expected to uh, find the sample that it is different or the sample that is the same, depending on what we are asking. And what we were doing in the listening test was to, or the idea was to measure the perceived difference between the stimuli through all the seven protocols to be able to compare the operational power of the seven protocols. As you see, I am mentioning here that the perceived difference between the stimuli uh, was measured through the measure D prime. You don't know what the D prime measure is, but I will explain, or uh, it is likely that you don't know what the D prime measure is, but I will explain it in, in detail in some slides. Okay, but for now, the only thing that you need to know is that after we have conducted all the listening tests, we were comparing the discriminability between a stimuli in terms of this D prime measure for all the protocols. So the listening test was carried out by 134 participants. And yeah, the results are shocking. So as we can see in terms of the D prime measure, which actually is measuring the difference that participants could perceive, we can see that uh, we have significant different results for the listening test, depending on the protocol that we are using. Okay, and there are some protocols that are better and some protocols that are worse. And actually we can see something which is really interesting, which is actually that the ABX protocol, which has been used in acoustics, um, particularly in room acoustics a lot, has uh, makes the participant to discriminate, discriminate way less than they could do. Okay, so there are some protocols that are better and some protocols that are worse, and some protocols that have a fair, uh, dis or that elicit a fair discrimination for the participants. As we can see, most of the protocols that we have been using in acoustics, so the triangle protocol, the ABX protocol, um, have really bad discrimination abilities. Also, we have been using the same different in acoustics, and that's, uh, that is one protocol that is a bit better. But some other protocols that have been used in other fields of sensory perception uh, are much better for discrimination tasks in, in room acoustics. We have also evaluated some, yeah, some experimental effects of different protocols um, yeah, that could have an influence on the results of listening tests. And one of them is the sequence effect. So depending on how, on the order in which we are presenting uh, the stimuli to the participants in each trial, uh, that can have an influence on discrimination. And that was indeed the case for the triangular protocol. As you can see, uh, for some sequences, we have the participants had much better discrimination abilities than for some other um, sequences, okay? Uh, so, we also should try to use um, protocols that 
don't have this kind of experimental effects. And also, we could see a learning tendency or an experimental bias of learning tendency for the A not A uh, with reference protocol. As you can see, the um, yeah the discrimination of the participants was increasing um, with different uh, replications of the same trial. Okay, even though this, these differences are not significant, as you can see, but we can see a tendency, and maybe with more participants, uh, some of these differences could get. Uh, to significant levels. Okay, so as we can, as, as we have seen, depending on the protocol that we employ to conduct listening tests, the discrimination of the participants can be really different. So, particularly in room acoustics, this can have a huge influence on, yeah, on perceptual assessments of difference between a uh, current state of a building, of a venue, and historical or, yeah, or original state uh, several centuries ago, or for the determination of the JND, or to assess the perceptual difference of modifying the absorption of a room. Okay, so we have to be really careful when selecting the the protocols that we are using to conduct these tests. Um, right now, I'm going to give some recommendations regarding analysis tools. Okay. Uh, for accurate non-biased non or reduced biased results of listening tests. And I'm going to start with the scaling protocols. I've already mentioned uh, this problem. Uh, normally in scaling um, protocols, we are asking the participants to use an scale to rate uh, certain attributes. And then what we normally do is to average for each of the attributes, average the result of each of the participants. Uh, but as I told you, these scales are normally discrete. And um, if we do the mean of the scores, uh, which is just averaging the results of all the participants, we are going we are going to get something that it is continuous. But actually, the participants were not able to select one point here or one point here, and they were only able to select one discrete value. So we are already biasing the results of our listening test in the analysis. Okay, so some solutions for that could be use the mode of scores, which is a more much more representative measure of the overall selection of all the participants, and it is a discrete measure as the scale was. Okay, so it is much more convenient, or for, at least for me and my colleagues, is much more. Uh, it makes much more sense than using the mean of the scores, even though this is recommended also in some standards. And also, yeah, many times uh, when we want to assess different, um, yeah, uh, whether we have significant difference between conditions, we normally use ANOVA, but ANOVA is useful when the data is following certain, or, or it is uh, accomplishing certain restrictions, which, are, which is not the case of discrete scales. So instead of ANOVA, uh, I would recommend to use Cochrane, Mantel, and Helsel analysis of the T square analysis, uh, which is similar to a TS student analysis, but for discrete, um, yeah, discrete data for uh, for data that it is not continuous. Okay, these are the recommendations that I could get for scaling protocols. Regarding the analysis of uh, difference testing. Um, in some other fields of sensory perception, they are using Thurstonian models, which is an accurate method to analyze results of different testing protocols. Okay, it's an extrapolation of signal detection theory. And it is based on the fact that the perception of the intensity of a certain attribute of a stimulus can be described by a Gaussian distribution of probability. Okay, Th what that means. That means that imagine we are tasting a cookie. Um, many times we are going to perceive the sweetness of the cookie uh, in the same way. But some of the times we taste this cookie, we can perceive it a little bit sweeter or a little bit less sweet. Okay. So the um, Thurstonian models are based on the fact that our perception of a same of the same ex stimuli in several tastings or in several hearings is um, Gaussian distributed. Since in different testing we are comparing a stimuli 
in the same trial, what we have is two different Gaussian distributions and how far they are apart is the D prime measure. So if the Gaussians are highly overlapped, uh, then the part, the, we can say that the stimuli were hardly differentiable for the participants. If they are far up, if they are more far apart, we can say that um, the two stimuli were mo moderately differentiable for the participants. And if they are really far apart, the two Gaussian distributions of the two stimuli compared uh, in, in a specific trial, we can say that the um, stimuli were clearly distinguishable uh, for the participants. Um, one good thing about this measure, the D prime measure, is that it is a measure of the of the perceptual difference between a stimuli, which is continuous, and it is a continuous measure which is not biased as the mean of scores in scales, which is also uh, computed on the basis of discrete data. Okay, uh, just to summarize, the D prime measure uh, is a continuous measure of perceptual distance, which is protocol independent. This is really important because no matter we use, uh, for example, constant reference to a trio, or if we use a ABX, or we use uh, a triangular uh, protocol, all of them are being able to analyze by the D prime measure. And in that way, even though each of the uh, protocols will have a different differentiation, but at least we can compare the results of the different uh, listening tests through the same measure. It is actually robust to some experimental effects also. And the um, very big drawback of the D prime measure of the Thurstonian models is that they are really uh, statistically complex since they require fitting a Thurstonian model specific for each protocol and each cogn uh, cognitive decision strategy, which is how our brain is understanding the sounds. So I'm presenting some examples. These are the ways of calculating the D prime measure for different protocols and also for the same protocol and two different cognitive decision strategies. Okay, so as you can see, they are not easy to calculate, but uh, Luckily, we have some analysis tools in R and also the data toolbox that we have designed that allows uh, the experimenters to, uh, to calculate the different value for the different products. So I don't really know how I'm going about time, uh, Lydia. Yeah, that is already uh, 20 past six. Okay, so I should be summarized so that we have time for questions. Yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I had some examples here of different uses of uh, different testing and Thurstonian models. For example, in room acoustics, I already mentioned this experiment. Besides comparing the different protocols, we could assess how different was the perception of the participants uh, for the different stimuli that they were hearing and we could derive the D prime measure. So how different these two conditions were, how different these two conditions were. Some other example, in this case, we were comparing, uh, yeah, something similar to the previous case, but uh, the change was not in the room, but it was in the emitter, which had the uh, characteristics of different uh, emission with different uh, face masks. And we could also derive the D prime measure. So how different is the intelligibility between uh, different types of face masks is also another example of, of use in on how room acoustics that we have used. Uh, we are, have also used this kind of test in some insulation. Okay, in this case, we have used uh, an attribute related uh, difference testing protocol. We were playing two sounds to the participants, A and B. And we were asking them to select which of them was more annoying, A, B, or no difference, okay? Not to bias the participants to select a specific uh, stimuli. And yeah, then we use the results of the D prime measure in combination with the data uh, of the differences between the different stimuli. And we could use it to further uh, elaborate in some kind of 
uh, investigation that we were doing in, in sound insulation. We have also used uh, this kind of listening test in soundscapes. Okay? We measured, uh, we did binaural measurements in different points of Madrid. And the idea was to see whether we could elicit, uh, well, if we could relate the psychoacoustic um, yeah, values measured in those measurement points with some geometrical filters. First, we did it uh, only based on objective data. And then we asked the participants to uh, compare the similarity between pairs of soundscapes, so different tasting. In these cases, are really um, uh, interesting case because we are mixing difference testing with a scaling, okay? And some other, which is difference testing and efficient difference testing based on some investigation by Jesper Van Dorp. Uh, for the participants to assemble groups of similarity between soundscapes. So as you can see, we have used uh, different testing in many different fields and for me, many different uh, uh, purposes. Finally, I'm going to briefly present the video toolbox, which is a, a software toolbox that we have designed for the performance and analysis of listening tests that allows the experimenter to conduct listening tests through any of the uh, protocols that I presented and to fix many of the different uh, configurations and also to analyze the results of the listening test. Just to summarize, some final recommendations when conducting listening tests. Uh, be careful and design the experiments focusing on the different sources of possible bias, uh, considering all the entities that I mentioned at the beginning. Look for the most representative sound samples and variation between a stimuli for the listening test that you're conducting so the results are relevant. Uh, try to use the less biased and more powerful protocols. That's something that we have not done uh, in the past in room acoustics specifically. And I think uh, on the basis of the results that I show you, it is important to focus on this and try to analyze the data for the test considering this type. So if the data that you are gathering is discrete, be careful to use methods that are for discrete data. And if it is continue, uh, if it is continuous, use methods that are uh, specifically designed uh, for the analysis of continuous data. And since I'm short of time, that could be all. I hope it was somehow interesting for you. And yeah, if you have any questions, just ask. If you have any discussion, uh, we can have it now, or we can have it through email, or we can arrange a meeting, or I'm always willing to uh, collaborate and to discuss about listening tests and everything they involve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny, for such a brilliant presentation. Uh, I'm sure. We're going to have some questions, so I uh, ask if any participants want to discuss something or make any question, feel free to raise your digital hand or write it in the chat. Uh, yes, Maria? Uh, Brian is asking uh, so the chat, uh, what is the link for your toolbox? Okay, uh, I will leave it here. As I as I told um, as I told you, it is not yet uh, completely finished. It's a beta that we have released. Okay, uh, but I will I will share it to you here, and um, yeah, hopefully it will be finished before summer. Uh, let me find it. It's in my GitHub. It's the only thing that I actually have in the GitHub. I have not used it before, uh, but let me let me share it with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is here. Okay, I will leave it here. Uh, 
Uh, regarding the slides, I have no problem in sharing them. If uh, Lydia can share with the attendees or or just leave me your uh, your email there and I will just send them to you, that's no problem. Well, thank you. Um, have you tied down the, the link? Uh, yes, I think I, I posted, uh, oh, sorry, I think I posted to some specific person. So yeah, there. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, does anyone have another question? I can make you one if anyone else can do it. I have a, um, if a curiosity more than other thing. So I wonder if you how I see somehow um, the use of other uh, cues, such as uh, visual cues, uh, is in any image or any 3D environment to uh, support the listening test with uh, any image, especially when you uh, are using the scaling uh, protocols? Yeah, uh, I mean, the visual cues, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, can have a significant influence on the auditory perception. Even if it is not an, something auditory, it can have, uh, in some cases, a huge influence. Um, we have conducted some listening tests by presenting visual cues of the, you know, of the of the venue uh, whose impulse response we were using in the listening test. Um, I have not analyze whether that had a specific impact, but I can tell you uh, from the time that I was in, in Aachen, in the Institute of, of Acoustics, that they were doing some experiments uh, in that particular sense. And indeed, the visual cues uh, can have a huge influence. For example, if you are assessing uh, yeah, the reverberance of a, a specific venue, and you have a visual cue of the venue, you are already biased to perceive the stimuli in a certain way. Uh, that's why I was telling that when we are doing listening tests, which are uh, yeah, experimental procedures in, in laboratory, uh, we are normally trying to control that uh, any cue that it is not purely acoustical is reduced as much as possible. Obviously, that's also somehow a bias because in real life, we are seeing the things. But we are trying to, um, yeah, to assess the, yeah, the the difference that only comes from the auditory stimuli. Uh, some other ways of doing this is mm, through questionnaires in real venues, for example. But it is much more time demanding because you have to change. If you want, for example, to change the, the perception of reverberance, you will have to install material or. So it is much more uh, time consuming. But yes, to your question, it can have a significant influence. Yeah, I'm asking that because, as you know, we're working now with um, with shelters and um, and sometimes caves. Yeah. When we ask the, the participant of our listening test about their impression of the realization of that stimuli, they are inside the room even if it's um, acoustically treated. So it's, it's a, the room has not a really a big influence on the on the stimuli, but visually they are in yeah. the so, so it's, it's kind of uh, important. Yeah, if, if, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you are just only trying to assess the purely auditory difference, uh, then it is always recommendable to try to reduce the information that comes from visual cues. So normally I use uh, light la uh, light lights, so nothing with a lot of lights, and I try the walls to be uh, always as septic as possible in color and in shape and in... yeah, that's not sometimes it's not easy, but I think it's a good way to try to reduce the bias that con could come from the visual cues. Thank you. Any other question or comment, curiosity? Thank you for attending, guys. Yeah. So uh, 
Okay, thank you. We can finish here then. Thank you everyone for attending the seminar. And uh, I think in a few weeks, it's possibly online as well for those who uh, wanted to check anything or whatever. There is one, one question uh, by Brian. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to, to answer. Oh, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, actually the most important question someone can do uh, regarding the different listening test protocols other than the operational power. Because that's one of the drawbacks of some of the, pro of the, of the protocols, that they are more time consuming than others, specifically those protocols that are using constant references. Obviously, if you want to imagine that you have uh, six different uh, stimuli and you want to compare all of them between them, uh, then you have to do at least 15 combinations of, uh, of a stimuli to do all the comparisons. OK, uh, but imagine that now you want to uh, do it with constant, constant references. Then the time it will take is uh, much longer. Uh, that's right. And uh, for in some cases uh, where, where the, the time is more important than the, yeah, than the illicit difference by the participants, uh, then it will be bad. But if we are trying to assess things that are subtle, su such as, for example, the, the J and D, of room acoustical parameters, which are not yet clear, even though they are in the ISO, they come from the past, and actually they are not matching what many people is uh, finding through uh, experimental research. Uh, if we are trying to, for example, to get a more accurate J and D uh, for the different room acoustical parameters, I think the time should not be the problem and that the most precise determination of the difference should be what's matter. But thank you for the question, Brian. Uh, I don't have the exact times for each of them, but some of them takes much longer than others. I can look it for you. Yes, Margarita. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, um, Daniel, for your, um, for your talk. Um, and this is just a comment um, that um, when you started your talk, you were talking about sort of, or you um, indicated three main um, areas, the physical world, the physiological and the psychological world. And I thought of, of um, area, and I thought that you were missing one and that's the cultural one. Um, because, for example, then later you were saying, uh, if you are doing a test uh, on a particular church, um, you need to use music or sounds that are related to the time that you are trying to test. But in our case, uh, we are trying to we, we, we are trying to test uh, with music that I mean, or, or we are trying to, to make, um, to test, uh, but we don't know the music that was used in that particular place. So, in fact, there was a discussion a couple of years ago um, with the ethnomusicologists in the project and, and, the, and the psychoacousticians uh, sort of saying, what can we do? What can we use? What should we use? And in the end, um, they decided that they were going to use natural sounds because these were the most sort of neutral ones. But even if you are testing something of the 15th century, it is a bit naive to think that you are going to be able to replicate what people were thinking or the cultural background that people had in the 15th century. So of course. I would add this fourth um, element, which is culture, that you need to add. You are, in you are totally right. And, and it is not only uh, different in the, in, the, in the different ages, but actually between different cultures, uh, different countries. Uh, some of the listening tests that we are doing, we are doing it in collaboration with some people from Sweden, uh, with some people from Germany, and even in those cases, uh, even though uh, 
we are all in the same cultural framework. So it, right now the, 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 the differences are more subtle, but of course, what you are mentioning is something that it is really important and that the cultural aspects of, I don't know, uh, yeah, 10 centuries ago are totally different. Uh, actually, there is one uh, one PhD uh, candidate working now in in the department I was working when I was doing my my research. I think she's around Maria La Rosa, and she's working with the with the music of the uh, Monasterio del Escorial, and yeah, some of the things that she's uh, she's uh, she's studying are related to yeah how people could perceive this or that. And yeah, she's always mentioning that it is not possible to know, even if you try to compare the building in the original state and right now, what you are going to get is not exactly a comparison between what happened and what is happening now because of the cultural aspects and the differences between the people of the past and the people that we are now. Uh, you are totally right. Thank you for the comment. Anyone else want to add something? No? Okay, so uh, again, Danny, thank you very much for participating in our seminar service. And I hope thank to see you for attending <laughs> next time. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. See you guys. Adiós.